1 John. We're looking for the book of 1 John in the New Testament. The New Testament book of 1 John. 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. We're going this evening as we study the important prophetic evangelistic topic of the unction and power of the Holy Ghost. The unction and power of the Holy Ghost is our topic this evening as we go into our study. You should have a handout at this time, a handout called the unction and power of the Holy Spirit. Please hold on to that handout. We'll be looking at that in just a second. Again, those that are watching online, you can get it also from us if you'd like a copy of this message or this even handout called the unction and power of the Holy Ghost. Look at the first John chapter 2 and verse 20 and we're going to find in first john 2 and verse 20 a word found once in the scripture we're going to find in this scripture this opening scripture our springboard text a word in this passage that's only found here only found once in the sacred scriptures <clears throat> an important word a very important word to study and understand its meaning and purpose to us in first john 2 and verse 20. you should have that already do you have that 1 John 2 and verse 20, let's read that. In 1 John 2 and verse 20, the Bible says this. It says, but ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. The word here in this verse, unction, is only found in this scripture. And some would believe, because of this reality, that the only place we see this work, you might say, is in the New Testament or in the last few verses of 1 John 2. This word unction, brothers and sisters, I want you to examine with me tonight from the scriptures and understand its divine and vital role in not only the work closing here in the last days, but in the whole gospel dispensation, the whole gospel era, the vital nature of unction must be understood by the people of God. Hence the tide tonight the unction and power of the Holy Ghost. When we look at that word unction, I like for those taking notes to write down a few things about unction. You can study out at your own time, looking at the Greek, look at the word unction and study it out even from the scripture as we look at tonight. The word unction is a very interesting word in language. Why? Because the word unction has two Meanings. Now you may say many things have two meanings. A lot of words have two meanings. But notice how the word unction is explained to us both in the scriptures and also in the dictionary. The word unction has two interesting meanings. The first meaning of unction is the act of anointing. The act of placing anointing oil or the act of anointing is called or deemed unction. However, a secondary meaning, if there really is a secondary meaning, maybe they're both the same thing, we'll find in a moment. But a secondary meaning of the word unction is the effect, E-F-F-E-C-T. And also the affect, A-F-F-E-C-T, of that unction wherever it rests. Now, that may seem difficult for some to understand because many people believe, and they're correct, that the word affect and effect are two different words. They are. And they mean different things. To effect something means to either change or to cause some difference in it or to begin something to have a result. If I push this desk over, I will effect the balance of it and cause something to happen by my action. To affect something is also to have a, a difference in something, but some people are affected by their emotions. Affect many times is using dealing with emotions. If I said, you know, I don't know why that affected her that way. I'm usually dealing with how she responded based upon how she felt about the influence of my words, my actions, or something she saw. Or he saw, it cannot be only one gender. Affect and effect are two different words, but it deals with an action or an influence. And when we look at the second definition, the Holy Ghost or the anointing can effect and affect those individuals or things in this earth 
that are in connection with an anointing or the effect of the Holy Ghost. I think there's no one here in this room that have gone through the studies we've gone through that do not believe and know that the Holy Spirit's action is typified in the Old Testament, in the sanctuary, by the anointing of oil. Do we all know that? Amen. One person. Amen. Amen. So when we look at this idea of the anointing, here in 1 John 2 and verse 20, the Bible says, But ye have an unction. Definite word. Ye have it. An unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. This definite statement spoken to the believers that were filled with the Spirit of God through conversion. These individuals had a definite statement made to them by John, saying that ye have this power, this anointing of the Holy Spirit, and you have the very uh, influence of the Spirit of God from the Holy One above working in you, and because of that, the Bible says, ye know all things. We have to understand tonight, or study together tonight, this work of unction. And the vital nature of unction, whether you sit in the pews on Sabbath, whether you sit behind the pulpit, whether you preach in the pulpit, whether you go in the community, no matter what position you may play in worship, leading worship, singing, if you don't have unction, if you don't have unction, if you don't have the touch of the Holy Spirit upon you, or through that touch, the ability to effect those around you and affect those around you in a spiritual context, then what are we really doing in this thing called Christianity? If ministers of the gospel do not have unction, if they don't have from this holy one above, this unction operating in their life, then they can with all the words and all the PowerPoint and all the various technology they may use with nice suits, robes, trappings, all types of ornaments in the church, banquets, fairs, whatever they may want, no matter how they multiply words or activities, without this unction, all the words can't spiritually affect those that hear and affect them to the saving of their soul. They may be tickled or gratified or even brought to a point where they think, wow, I'm really excited about what they hear. But it does not affect them unto salvation. It does not affect their heart and their mind, causing them to make a change in the way that they work. And brothers and sisters, I want you to know, unless we have this unction from the Holy One, we can't do any type of ministry effectively for God, whether by pen or by voice, because without the unction, we are not able to be consecrated, sanctified, or even prepared for gospel ministry in any wise. Notice in the book of Exodus, we see that. Notice in Exodus shows very clearly that this anointing or this unction is the essential thing for those that would be a part of God's holy work in any dispensation, but even more so in this last one. We're in the book of Exodus, quickly. Exodus 28. Exodus 28 chapter. Notice the word, or even this text we go to many times, dealing with proper dress. But notice the full scripture. Exodus 28. Exodus the 28th chapter. Look at verse 40 and 41. We're talking about the unction of the Holy Ghost. Exodus chapter 28. Are we in Exodus 28? Look at verse 40 and 41. Exodus 28, verse 40. And verse 41, the Bible says very clearly, in Exodus 28 and verse 40, this. It says, <clears throat> as a matter of fact, let me make sure I'm in the right place, because these lines are not clear in my mind. Exodus 28 and verse 40. It says, And Aaron's sons, thou shalt make coats, and thou shalt make for them girdles, and bonnets shalt thou make them for glory and for Beauty. This is the righteousness outwardly in the dread. But look at verse 41. And thou shalt put them upon Aaron thy brother and his sons with him, and thou shalt do what? Anointing. What's anointing them? Thou shalt unction them. Are you following me? Mm -hmm. Thou shalt unction them. Thou shalt anoint them. Listen carefully. And by doing so, what are they doing? Consecrate them. And by consecrate, what are you doing? Sanctify them. That what? They may minister unto me in the... In other words, brothers and sisters, no one can minister in the priestly office in the word of God unless they were sanctified. They were consecrated. And it was impossible to affect this without what? The unction. They had to be unction. They had to receive this anointing. The anointing, the Bible says in verse 41, consecrated them to heavenly service. That anointing was the mean by them being sanctified. That anointing was the mean by which they were through this operation, anointing, consecrating, sanctification, 
they will be able made daily and hourly to minister in the priest's office. As Malachi said, by this the priest's lips will keep knowledge. By this the priest would fear before the Lord. By this the people can draw to the people of God that were preachers and teachers and hear the word of God at their mouth, Malachi said. By this they show forth that they had this divine unction. And by the unction they were made ready for God's ministry. Praise God for education facilities. But without the unction, it's all a fairy tale. It's all a waste of time. Thank God for medical missionary facilities showing people the way of doing natural wraps and colonics. Praise God for that. But without the unction, you're only making healthy sinners. You're only preparing people, armies of, of healthy sinners to chase you down the end time. Without the unction, bringing people to a realization of what it means to see Christ as a living Savior and accept Him. Hearts being converted by the power of the Spirit of God. What are we doing unless we have been consecrated to a true understanding? Unless we know all things that are pertaining to life and godliness because of receiving this unction that consecrates us and sanctifies us and prepare us for gospel ministry. Brothers and sisters, do you understand really what happens? What happens when the Holy Spirit comes upon a man or woman? When that woman or man that comes their heart to God and truly allow the Spirit of God to be poured into this vessel that they may be consecrated and sanctified to his work? Do we understand what is this work? Well, Jesus showed us. As our great example, Jesus spoke in John, sorry, Luke 14, Luke 4, pardon me, in Luke 4, he spoke and showed us exactly what the effect and the affect of the Holy Spirit or this anointing would be in the life of all those that would receive the Spirit of God. In the book of Luke, just to see that quickly. Look at Luke. Luke, the fourth chapter. Luke 4, 18. We know the scripture. Luke 4, 18. Notice what Jesus said, which shows us the actual manifestation, the effect of the unction, unction in the life, the effect of the anointing upon believer. Also, we're going to see the affect in the hearts and minds of those ministered to, those that come into the purview or into the, into the, into the viewing, the, the ministry uh, window of those under the unction, notice the effect upon those under that ministry. In the book of Luke, Luke 4 and verse 18, the Bible says this, Luke 4, 18. Luke 4 and verse 18. Notice the word of God. Notice what the Savior says is the work when the Spirit of the Lord or the anointing or the unction from the Holy One above is upon you. Luke 4, 18. Say amen when you have that. Amen. Luke 4, 18 says, the Spirit of the Lord is where? <clears throat> unction. Because, notice the effect. Because he has anointed me to? Preach the gospel. What does the anointing cause you to do? Preach the gospel. What does the anointing sanctify and consecrate unto you? The preaching. Preaching of the what? Gospel. Preaching of stories. Gospel. Preaching of what Black Lives Matter is doing. Preaching of what LGBTQ, to LGBTQ, XYZ need to do to be more safe in the church. Preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to the poor. In other words, your gospel is not going to be $100 a head. Your gospel is not going to be only those that have money. Your gospel is going to be even uh, free all over the world that people can hear the word. The Bible says the gospel is going to be preached by the anointing, by that selfless power that comes from above. It will consecrate you to do a work even for the poor. He says he has sent me. In other words, that anointing will cause you not to sit still. It will send you. You'll be with fire in your bones. You've got to go out and do the work. It will send you to do what? Heal the brokenhearted. Heal the broken legs? Heal the broken arms? Oh, I'm sure that would be something too. But, but notice the work it says here. Heal the broken heart. The effect and the effect is largely seen by those individuals that are sent by the power of the Spirit in the heart. Healing heart sins. Healing heart sins. The broken Hearted. Those that have heart sins are affected by anointed preachers. Those that like intellectual sermons or like to study prophecy or various things that tickle their intellect or things that are clever unto them. Those individuals are not changed in heart. They become more intellectual, more savvy, more gospel familiar heathens. But when those that are being affected and affected by the gospel are in connection with this anointing, we see the broken heart. Heal. We see heart sins affected and also removed, purged 
by the effect, not of the preacher, but the spirit that's working through the living instrument where she or he can preach the word and it affects the heart. It doesn't just inform the heart, it affects the heart. It causes men to tremble under the grace, the love, the power, and the warnings of God. Again, we're going on. Heal the brokenhearted to preach deliverance. People will be set free. Free from the things that bind them by this type of ministry, both in word and doctrine, individual heart sins, their heart sins will be removed. Their what? Their bondage will be replaced by deliverance to give the captives or deliverance to the captives and recovering a sight to the blind. This is a needed work for the Laodicean in church because the Laodicean in church is blind. What does the ladies see in church need? What type of ministers or angels should go to them? Ministers that have the spirit. Ministers that have the unction of the Holy Spirit. That recovering of sight to the blind could be possible. And liberty. To set at liberty them that are captive. Bruised. The wounds of sin. Look at Isaiah chapter 1. The wounds of sin bind people. Past wrongs, past ills, grief, guilt, all these things bind people in shackles that they need to be liberated from. And the ability to be set free is not in their own power. It is by the word, the word spoken, the word preached, the word penned, by this and prayer and by the moving of the Holy Spirit, individuals are set free. They are given sight. They are able to be free indeed because of the unction of the Holy Spirit resting upon those going forth, sent Apostles, by the Holy One above. Education and salvation comes from the anointing. Healing and wholeness come through the anointing. Liberty and life come through the anointing. The effect and affect of this divine gift in the heart of individuals and through the lips and the words and actions of these individuals. They have people around them that hear their words or see their life and manner of life. These individuals are affected toward the kingdom. They are able to, by seeing and by being changed, by the seeing, glorify their Father in heaven and also press into the kingdom. Brothers and sisters, in the book of Luke, you stay in Luke, in the book of Luke chapter 24. Look at Luke 24 and see the effect of those that hear these sermons preached to the poor. What would be the effect upon the individual? Would they just be tickled? And think these things are interesting? Look at Luke 24. Luke 24 and verse 32. We know all these scriptures, but see them in the context of the anointing. Luke 24 and verse 32. What does it say? Luke 24, 32. It says quickly. Look, Luke 24 and verse 32. It says, And they said one to another, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? It was not by screaming at the top of their lungs or running back and forth or with a guitar or a piano. Rip, 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 none of that foolishness. They didn't need any accents or, act or exaltation to make the word powerful just by talking with them. And the earnestness and the power that attended the words, individuals weren't just informed. They were not just, you know, interested. It said, did not our hearts burn within us? Did not these words affect our very heart? It went past the idea of just what is interesting or what is something I'd like to hear or something that may be something that maybe that I'll keep for educational purposes. It caused the heart itself to burn. Maybe that burning was healing that broken heart. Taking care of heart sins. These individuals in the world to Emmaus, by the way, were individuals who were disciples and they had lost the faith. They had lost their faith in God, and they even said on the road, it said, we had believed it was he that would have delivered Israel. We believe it was, past tense. We don't believe that anymore. That's why we're walking home, because we saw the cross, and because we did not understand the prophecy. We had not prayed and fasted. We did not pay some time and really invest our heart and mind in making sure this unction was upon us and the understanding of the word. When the cross took place, it dashed all our Hopes. We had thought it was him, but by the talking, by the ministry of the word, by the power of the Holy Spirit, their hearts burned. And that burning was the effect of faith being actuated in the heart. The effect and the effect of the unction in the life. Brothers and sisters, in Luke 24, 32, we see uh, a type 
of what is possible if individuals would consecrate their heart and mind to Jesus Christ and allow in their Bible studies, in their preaching, in their health work, in whatever work they do, by pen or by voice, let it be seasoned with the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the essential work for this time. In Luke 6.45, Luke 6.45, we know Luke 6.45. In Luke 6.45, the Bible says a good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, bringeth forth what? Good things. And then it says at the end, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. This hard work is effectual because the speaker, those that are receiving the unction, are keeping their hearts pure. Keeping this channel of communication between earth and heaven, which is the heart, with the mind, pure. And by keeping it pure and surrendering to God and keeping this vessel clean and right side up, the spirit can be poured in and overflow into the hearts and minds of those that read their books and hear their message and see their ministry or are affected by their ministry. This unction flows over, pressed down, running together and overflowing. It is the work of the Holy Spirit. It is not the individual themselves that when they believe, they will believe based upon the demonstration of power and not upon man's wisdom or the words of man. As a matter of fact, that's the Bible says that. Look what it says in the book of 1 Corinthians 2. This is the Bible. In 1 Corinthians 2, look what Paul says. Paul puts it this way. 1 Corinthians 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 5 through 13. Notice 1 Corinthians 2, verse 5 through 13. That our faith, that power that burns in the heart of believers, that our faith may stand in the power of this anointing, the power of God, and not in the words and wisdom of man. This is the need of the unction. And notice how this unction teaches, not just in hollering, carrying on, but by scripture, line upon line and precept upon precept. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 5 says this. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 5, it says, that's your faith. Are we there? Amen. That your faith should not stand in what? The wisdom, the knowledge, the fancy sayings of men. But stand how? In the power of God. The power of God is the work of the Holy Spirit. The power of God is the gospel and the revealed righteousness therein. Romans 1.16 says, it says this. It's just saying the power of God. How be it, verse 6, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in what? Hmm, the wisdom of God and the mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which, the God, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of... Is he talking about the mystery of prophecy? The mystery of the gospel? The mystery of spiritual truth and the new birth? All these things would have kept them from crucifying the Lord of glory? It says in verse 9, But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of men the things which God prepared, prepared for them that love him. But God, listen to verse 10, But God has revealed it unto them, or revealed them unto us by what? By the anointing, by this unction. He revealed it unto them. And that's why 1 John says, Ye have an unction from the Holy One, and you what? And ye know all things. It says it right here. It says, verse 10, But God hath revealed it unto them, or unto us, by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things. Ye shall know all things. Yea, the deep things of God. Now when it says all things, that means the lotto number? That means who's going to be the final person on, on, on lost? Or, or, or who's going to be the person that wins jeopardy this year? No, when it says all things, all things that pertain to what? Life and Godness. All things that are able to make you wise into salvation through Christ Jesus. All things that are in the scripture that will give you the ability to stand the last days. It says this. Look at verse 11. For what man knoweth the things of a man? Say the spirit of a man that is in him. Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the... So if we want knowledge, where should we look? Those schools are wonderful. Universities are wonderful. All these things, if properly run, are wonderful. But where should we look? Or where is the true source of knowledge of salvation and those things that pertain to everlasting life? It's the anointing. It's the work of the Spirit. 
What man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of a man that's in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth what? No man. Knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is? Of God. This is the anointing. This is that unction of 1 John we just read about. But we have received this anointing or unction, the spirit of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us this is why first john 2 20 is our beginning text because ye have an unction from the holy one and ye what know all things verse 13 which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teaches but which the holy ghost teaches comparing spiritual things with spiritual things and we know that john 6 63 says that the words that I speak unto you, Jesus said, they are spirit and they are life. So Holy Ghost teaching and those that are preaching under the unction and by the power of the unction are not only speak with words that will burn the consciences of men, but they will compare scripture with scripture. In teaching this truth, they will prove everything by the word, line upon line and precept upon precept. And these words will not be a hodgepodge of nonsense. They'll make sense. They will not only make sense intellectually and logically, they will cause the hearts of those that hear them to burn within them because they're being taught of God. Line upon line and precept upon precept. That's why 1 John says this. Again, we're going to 1 John. Let's, let's look at here before we get our hand down. 1 John. 1 John 2 and verse 27. In 1 John 2, 27, those that have this unction from above, that know all things, that have received the Spirit of God and are shown the things of the Spirit of God and God revealed them to all things by the Spirit. All things that pertain to life and Godness. All things that would make you wise in the salvation. All things that would give you that eyesight to be able to discern evil under any God and eschew those evil. To be able to discern and to realize what is evil. Does everyone see what is evil? No. And they'll think that because you say, hey, that's not, I wouldn't do that because so and so. Oh, you're being harsh. You're being critical. You're being judgmental. The same thing they said before Jerusalem fell. You're being critical. Why should we flee our homes? Brothers and sisters, in the book of 1 John 2, in verse 27, 1 John 2, 27, knows the word of God as we take our hand out and look at some quick quotes from the pen of inspiration. 1 John 2 and verse 27, do we have that? Amen. It says, but the anointing, what's that? Unction. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you and ye need not that any man teach you but as the same anointing teaches you of all things and is truth and is no lie and even as it has taught you ye shall no one is abiding in him without unction no one is abiding in him without the anointing of the Holy Spirit and no one that is failing to have this unction will be consecrated in the ministry, sanctified in ministry, and prepared to do the work of the ministry because without this unction, it is impossible. Brothers and sisters, Aaron had two sons that wore the holy garments on the outside, but inwardly they were dead men's bones. And they put strange fire before the Lord, and they were consumed. Brothers and sisters, when God stands up to do this work in the last days, who shall abide in the burning fires? And we look at the Word of God through the pen of inspiration. What does Ellen White say as we close? What does Ellen White say about the unction and power of the Holy Spirit? Because someone look at these words and hear these messages and say, well, you know what? I hear what he's saying, but I, I, I believe I have the unction. I, I believe I'm ready. I believe I can preach. I believe I, 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 I'm, I'm ready to go and do a work. Or all my Netflix and videos and various things that I'm doing that is completely defying the temple and making this, this cup not only right side down, but also feel that nothing can enter into a divine nature, they believe themselves ready and all giving the message and having power to reach hearts unto conversion and conviction. They believe that, but knows the pen of inspiration. The pen of inspiration shows us clearly that was the need and the fallacy of false thinking when it comes to this unction of the Holy Spirit. We're reading the Review and Herald. We're reading Review and Herald, December 15th. Review and Herald, December 15th, 1885, Article A, Paragraph Two. It says this. Again, if you're on the online, you can watch it on the note on our Facebook page. It says, we must have the holy unction from God. We must have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So what is the unction of God? It's the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Those that be sealed are nothing more than those that have a double portion of the unction of God. 
We must have the holy unction from God. We must have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. For this is the only efficient agent in the promulgation of sacred truth. The word promulgation means the spreading forth, the presenting, the messaging to priests, to get online and so on, and newspaper, to advertise, to spread it out, is the promulgation. How shall we spread the message or the truth? The only effective agent is the Holy Spirit. And only those that have this anointing are able to present. Brother says you can teach just as well as a monkey can. You can repeat truth just like a parrot can. But who can reach the heart and bring individuals to conviction and to make decisions? It says it's the only effective agent in the promulgation of truth. Yet this is what we most lack. The divine power combined with human effort, connection first and last and ever with God, the source of our strength, is absolutely necessary in our work. We must hang our whole weight upon the world's Redeemer. We must be, I'm sorry, He must be our dependence and strength. Without this, all our efforts will be unavailing. Even now, the time has come when we must re recognize this fully, or we shall be outgeneraled by a powerful, cunning, for who's that? Satan himself. We must connect more closely with God and all our plans and arrangements must be in harmony with his plans or they will not prove all our plans must be in harmony with the Holy Ghost's plan or we will not have him abiding with us or we will not be effectual. Again, reviewing Herald. May 30th, 1871. We're going all the way through Reviewing Herald with this thing. Reviewing Herald, May 30th, 1871, Article C, page 25, says this. I never realized more than I do today the exalted character of the work, its sacredness and holiness, and how important that we should be fit for the work. I see it in myself. I must have a new fitting up, a holy unction or I cannot go any further to instruct others. What's a holy unction? It's a fitting up for the work. And without this, she could not go any farther to instruct anyone. It says, I must know that I am walking with God. I must know that I understand the mystery of godliness. I must know that the grace of God is in my own heart, that my own life is in accordance with his will, that I am walking in his footsteps. Then, my words will be true. My actions will be right. Are you listening to this? Again, go down to the third paragraph. Review and Herald, September 4th, 1888. This is during the time of the 1888 messages. Review and Herald, September 4th, 1888. Paragraph 5. The heavenly unction comes upon men how? Unseen. To do what? To quicken those who love and fear God and to make them Powerful in the word of God. All heaven is interested in the work of saving souls. And if the teacher of the Bible truth, or teacher of Bible truth, will seek the Lord, the promise is given, he shall find. If he asks, he shall receive. If he knocks, it shall be opened unto him. There is no excuse for anyone being destitute of divine help. There is no reason why anyone should be stumbling upon the dark mountains of unbelief. The word of God is pledged in his abundant promises. And if we fail, the responsibility rests upon us individually. Who have accepted the solemn position that makes us a mouthpiece for God, the promises are made upon plainly stated conditions. And if we perish, we have no one to blame but ourselves. Are you listening to this? Let's go on. This is Review and Herald, August 8, 1878. Review and Herald, August 8, 1878. Article A, paragraph 18. It says, ministers who would labor effectively for the salvation of souls must be both Bible students and men of prayer. It is a sin for those who attempt to teach the word to others to be themselves neglectful of its study. All who feel the worth of souls will feel, flee to the stronghold of truth where they may be furnished with wisdom, knowledge, strength, and divine power to work the works of God. And by this, brothers, by the way, by this, 
ye know all things. These are things it speaks of when it says knowing all things and will reveal these things. It's talking about this. It's talking about this wisdom, knowledge, strength, and divine power to work the work of God. This is what it speaks of in the Word of God. It goes on to say this. They should not rest without the holy unction from on high. Let me read that one more time. That's too important it's not to glass over. They should not rest without the holy unction from on high. Too much is at stake for them to dare to be careless in regard to their spiritual advancement. Ministers of Christ, your coldness, your lack of prayer, of fervor, and of heavenly wisdom may turn the bounds with a soul and send it to perdition. Ye messengers of truth, ye cannot afford to be indifferent in these last days. Our feet on the borders of the eternal world, and every probationary moment is more precious than gold. Ministers of Christ, whom God has made the depositories of his law, you have an unpopular truth. You must bear this truth to the world. Warnings must be given men to prepare for the great day of God. You must reach those whose hearts are callous by sin and love of the world. Continual and fervent prayer and earnestness in well-doing will bring you into communion with God. Your mind and heart will imbibe a sense of eternal things and the heavenly unction which springs from connection with God will be poured upon you. Did you see that? The holy unction or heavenly unction springs from connection with God. How does it come or pour forth? By connection with God. By this connection, we can have this unction. It goes on to say this. It will render your testimony powerful to convict and convert. Your light will not be uncertain, but your path will be luminous with heavenly brightness. God is all powerful and heaven is full of light. You have only to use the means God has placed in your power to obtain the divine blessing. Do you see that? It will make your testimony what? You didn't see that. It will make your testimony powerful to convict and convert. What we see least of in these days. A lack of the unction. Much talk, much debate, very little unction. Last line. Last quotation. There's two paragraphs here. I'm closing out. Review and Herald, February 28th. Review and Herald, February 28th, 1899. Paragraph 9. Listen closely to this as we close. Will the workers in the various lines of God's work ponder these things? A large share of the shallowness of the work is the result of the shallowness of the workers. When the Spirit of God works, something will be done, and in much larger degree than we have seen. Where is the power of the workers? Where is the demonstration of the Spirit? Where is the assurance of faith? There is a sad deficiency in the preaching of God's Word. Much fluent talking may be done. Much cleverness may be shown in the presentation of different points of truth. All this has been seen. Ears have been gratified, or are gratified. A present emotion is excited. But where are the souls who are identifying themselves with Christ? Where is the holy unction? the living earnestness, the deep moving of the Spirit of God. Where are those who expound the truth by upholding staunch, correct principles, irrespective of loss or gain? Oh, that God would impress his ministers with the need of being thoroughly converted. Oh, that he would impress them with their need of an abiding Christ. Then there would be a revival of the Holy Spirit. The question has been asked. What kind of vessels does God use? What does Christ say? Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and you shall find rest unto your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What kind of vessels are meat for the master's use? Empty vessels. When we empty the soul of every defilement, we are ready for use. Oh, brothers and sisters, the Bible says that we can have that unction from the heavenly one, that holy heavenly one above, and we can know all these things. We can know what it is, what it is to see souls saved in the God's kingdom. We will know what it is to give our testimony with living power. Not a power that's seen, a 
of how this felt. It would have its effect upon those that hear, those that feel, those that are moved to make a decision. Oh, brothers and sisters, are we in desperate need of the unction day by day, hour by hour? What shall we do with these words? Shall we let them fall to the ground? Or shall we ask, Lord, even, even right now, to forgive us and cleanse us, to purify our hearts and minds, and let not this be another prayer meeting, but a call to prayer, to searching the scriptures, to asking for that purification of heart, that anointing that will consecrate and sanctify us and make us ready for putting on the heavenly garments and going forth to do God's work. This is my prayer tonight. And if you have that similar prayer, if you've been convicted of a need of a deeper indwelling Holy Spirit or to have through repentance the gift of the Holy Spirit, pray with me this prayer as we bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we come to thee in prayer tonight. All cast down. Lord, decrease, praying that thou mayest increase. Lord, we pray that you would affect our hearts individually. And we need these broken hearts to be healed by the anointing that rests upon thee, that rests in thy word. Cause our hearts to burn within us, dear God. Heal and cauterize these wounds caused by sin. Affect these heart sins, dear God, and forgive us. Forgive us, dear God, for our endless and lack of true, powerful intercession, asking, seeking, and knocking for this divine gift, the cleansing, purifying, guiding, instructing word that teaches all things. Lord, we need that wisdom that comes from above, that's first peaceful, first pure and peaceful. Let us experience and also enter into fellowship with the Holy Ghost through the anointing. Anoint us as Aaron of old. Allow the Lord to fall from our head down to the skirts of our garments. Allow us to be purified and ready to share the influence, the sweet savor of that anointing oil all around our work, our home, wherever we may go, that men may be drawn to the power and prince of the Holy Spirit, that the gospel commission can be finished, that our works, our actions, our habits, as well as our word, may be evidence of the effect and also in other men affect them to the kingdom of God. This is our prayer. And we thank you for hearing our prayer and continuing to impel us to prayer of this nature daily for the unction of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And amen.